Well, please welcome to the stage our panel of experts. First up, Jacob Hickey is the writer and series producer of Filthy, Rich and Homeless and the head of Factual for Blackfella Films. If you'd like to make your way onto the second chair there, I'll be taking the first. Dr. Catherine Robinson from the Social Action Research Centre for Anglicare Tasmania and also the expert advisor to Filthy, Rich and Homeless. Tom Elliott is the host of the Drive program on 3AW in Melbourne. Drive, it's the best slot you can get. And Christine Thurkel, who is a graduate of the Peer Education Support Program with the Council to Homeless Persons in Melbourne. Uh, she has, of course, a lived experience herself. Christine is now a passionate advocate in the sector and she's um, going to share some of her personal experiences on the many interviews uh, she has done with the media because she has spoken to the media. Of course, one thing we do, us media, Tom knows this, is we always say, can you give us a lived experience? Because we don't always want to speak to <coughs> advocates, we want to speak to the people who are experiencing it so she can talk about what that's like. Okay, I'm going to throw to each of these panellists. They're going to just very briefly give us their perspective. Very briefly, I say, because I want this to be dynamic. I'm going to start with Jacob and then move through the panel. Jacob? Where would you like to do it? Here? Where would you like me? Come here, why not? Take the floor. <laughs> it's rare. Um, firstly, thanks very much for inviting me, you know, TV producer here. It's, it's just great. I've already seen a few people from the sector who helped us make the program, and without their involvement, it couldn't happen. So, hello and thank you again to all of you, you know, both in Series 1 and this series. I guess, um, so I head a factual at Blackfella Films, as Patricia was saying, and I guess we always want to make series that have a social conscience at their core. Um, you know, we've made First Contact and The Tall Man and Deep Water and dealt with Aboriginal issues and gay hate crime. And so for us, tackling this social issue was entirely logical. And SBS wanted a big series in this space. And so there was this great alignment, you know. And I guess we come from the place where, I don't know, having a social conscience doesn't equal worthy and unpopular in television terms. Um, it can be aligned. Um, inspiring attitudinal change and getting people to watch at the same time. Um, it's vital that those two things are married. Um, in fact, um, it's necessary that they are um, if you really want to make an impact. Um, I've made documentaries, Blackfella Films have made documentaries that we're deeply proud of, um, but people haven't always necessarily watched in huge numbers. In recent times, we're very happy with the kind of ratings we've got, um, but the danger is unless you make something that has cut through, you're in danger of preaching to the converted and what we want to do is provoke a national conversation to inform and to get people talking about an issue, which will then in turn inspire attitudinal change. And I guess, I suppose that's, you know, that's our role in a pluralistic democracy, I guess, you know, that's what we can do. Sorry, I should know about that, shouldn't I? Um, that's, what we can, that's what we can do to help. That's why TV producers are behind the camera. Um, look, we're really proud that the series, series one attracted over the three nights somewhere in the region of two million viewers. Um, and that goes to show that people care deeply and they want to know more. I guess what's more important in, some, in many respects is that provoking that national conversation that we're talking about. And SBS conducted a survey after the first series um, that looked at behavioural change. And about 45% of people who watched the first series said that they'd changed their attitude towards homeless people and that one in three had in since donated their time or money to homeless people. Um, and that was, that was great to hear, but I guess we wanted to make a second series, and I suppose, why do you make a second series? Well, because we want to make a second series because we want to engage deeper with the issue. We want people to understand more, and we want to build on that attitudinal change. And, you know, we hope that the people who have the power to make change are watching. You know, I don't make an apology for that. That's what we want to do as program makers, that's what SBS want to do as a broadcaster to get important issues out there um, which start this conversation. Um, the truth though is we can't do any of this without people with a lived experience of homelessness and we can't do it without the sector. Um, Patricia's right, we'd always ask for the lived experience person and this was a platform for them 
to tell their stories within the show. Yes, it's about the five people you've just been watching. They're like a gateway in. They're a vehicle for the series. It actually becomes about people with a lived experience telling their stories, engaging, educating, and actually, which is something we'll talk about later, getting quite a lot out of it in the process as well. Um, so I hope you watch. I'm sure it will attract some level of criticism. I think you have to be up for that if you make this kind of programming. Um, and we're excited about it. And what we're most excited about is building on that attitudinal change and seeing where it might take us. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. I hope you enjoy it next week. Catherine Robinson's up next, if you want to come and share some of your thoughts. Thanks. <clears throat> As a way into spending my few minutes to explain what I see as the value of filthy rich and homeless, I'm going to start with a few contextualising observations about mass media uh, and representations of difference. So you're just going to have to bear with me. In particular, I want to argue that mass media often works in the genre of horror. And thinking this through further <clears throat> helps me to clarify what is different about what Filthy Rich and Homeless offers viewers and the intervention it makes into more common representations of homelessness. The genre of horror <clears throat> works with very well understood psychoanalytic drives. During a horror film, for example, we, the audience, are suspended in an encounter with that which fills us with fear and disgust. And then at the film's end, we are released, literally and psychoanalytically, back into our own world of reaffirmed order. Horror taps into the profound psychoanalytic processes which drive our formation as human individuals. As people who like to imagine ourselves as largely separated from others in mind and body. Bodily and social order are critical to how we retain a sense of control and of self-identity. For psychoanalyst and cultural theorist Julia Kristeva, that which is foreign to us, which threatens to pollute, to disturb, to disrupt, historically figured as the Jew, the gypsy, the refugee, the vagrant rough sleeper. They're all read through our deeply personal desires for wholeness, separation, boundedness, emplacement. At a psychoanalytic level then, our encounters with the strange and different mobilise, repress stress about our self-formation such that we lash out with suddenly unleashed anxiety at those who are different from us. And doing this makes us feel in control again. We soothe ourselves, remind ourselves that we are not that. And we retain and reproduce a powerful and purified sense of ourselves through our denigration of others, of the foreign. So we call for solutions to restrict, resolve, remove and cleanse. And we have a tragic weight of history to remind us of our psychoanalytic fragility and when given full range, what in humanity this fragility can enable. It's a pretty ordinary trick then when mass media taps into the dynamic of horror and sells narrow, often extreme and decontextualised encounters with difference. We buy cheap thrills of self-confirmation 
and those who sell us horror are loved for the release they provide. For me, involvement in Filthy Rich and Homeless has been a unique opportunity to contribute to a project explicitly aimed at holding rather than resolving encounters with difference. For me, Filthy Rich and Homeless is a deeply political project which sets out to challenge the common horror dynamic in community and media encounters with homelessness. In my role as series consultant, it was my job to support Blackfella film producers and their team of directors in the field to refigure homelessness for a mass audience. Their aim from the outset was to engage in depth with the lived experience of homelessness in order, in turn, to enable better understanding of what meaningful responses to end homelessness could look like. This involved me in a lot of explicit teaching work about the ethics and politics of engaging with people experiencing homelessness and with gatekeeping services, about what causes and ends homelessness, and about how homelessness can be experienced by different individuals, by different population cohorts. And on screen, my role was similar, a kind of teaching, contextualising role. Of course, in the immediate sense, directed at individual participants, but always too at individual viewers of the series. Ultimately, <clears throat> in its refusal to re-engage the horror dynamic, what the series achieves, in my view, is a powerful depiction of human vulnerability. It does not seek to release viewers from this, quite the opposite. And it does not locate vulnerability only in those homeless. The series uncomfortably holds open homelessness as a lived experience as a social and political problem. And fundamentally, it asks what might be possible if instead of turning away in horror, we engage and shoulder our shared vulnerability. Thank you. Our next... Uh Panelist is Tom Elliott, who is a 3AW Drive presenter. Please welcome him. Okay, well, we are going to talk a lot about uh, the mass media fairly soon, and I'm probably one of the evil members of that. I've been broadcasting at 3AW for 16 years. Uh, for about four or five years, I was an opinion columnist at the Herald Sun. Um, I've had gigs at Channel 9, 7, and 10, although I'm yet to grace the presence of SBS. Um, <laughs> Also, I've been on the ABC quite a lot. So, uh, I'd first just say I've lived in the inner suburbs of Melbourne, around the Collingwood Fitzroy area for over 20 years. I'm fairly familiar with the day-to-day -day issues of homelessness. I see it around me all the time. Um, I'm a former business person, and I like to see solutions of things, or about things, rather than just endlessly raising awareness about issues. So, I'm always interested in people who have got an idea, a way to fix things up. Because fundamentally, that's what business is about. It's about meeting customers' needs or you know, providing solutions. So that's something that I hope emerges out of this, this two-day conference. But as far as the mass media goes, and again, broadcasting on 3AW, we're a very well-known radio station, or writing for the Herald Sun, you know, probably Australia's most read newspaper. I'm not here to, to promote them, but you get a very good sense of what the average person thinks. And our audiences, by the way, aren't all Liberal or aren't all Labor. They're not or conservatives who say, F off, we're full on their utes or whatever. They, they are all parts of Australia, all different sorts of people, all age groups, all political leanings. So you get a good sense, because I talk to people every day. Three hours of my program, I take on average 45 to 50 calls. And they're not really filtered, you know, we don't know who's going to ring up. I have no idea what they're going to say until they say it. So it's like a three hour conversation every single day. And my program has more talk back relative to the number of hours it's on than I think any other show, certainly on AW and quite possibly on the ABC as well. 
And that's because I like listening to people. I like hearing about what they have to say. Modern media is not the evil behemoth a lot of people think it is. At the Herald Sun, for example, you are given a blank sheet of paper. There you go, 800 words. Write about whatever you want. It's up to you. You're going to see some stuff, uh, I think, on the screen later on, you know, things like what Rita Panahi has said and whatever. She is not told what to say. I was not told what to say. We are just given a certain amount of words, a certain amount of page to fill, and we fill it. So this idea that Rupert Murdoch rings you up, you know, Thursday night and says, I want this in on Saturday is not the way it is. It's the same on 3AW as well. We are not some unified whole. In fact, each program is its own thing and we compete vigorously, sometimes viciously with each other to get gifts, to get stories, to get ideas. Our views vary enormously. I mean, I regularly chat with Neil Mitchell and people like that, but he and I could not be further apart when it comes to our, I guess, beliefs and opinions on things, but there is room for us at the same station. So, who am I? Well, I like to listen. I also like to talk, otherwise I wouldn't be in talkback radio. Media is not some big hole with an agenda. It's just a whole lot of people putting forward their opinions. And I hope that's what happens today. Thank you. Okay, and uh, our final person well, we'll be talking, but to address you directly is Christine Thurkel, who, as we said earlier, has actually had a lived experience and has spoken to many media about that experience. Please welcome her. Thank you. Um, I've, I'm part of the, a graduate from the peer education support program that's run by the Council of Homeless Persons, uh, which means I've got a lived experience of being without a home. So I had my mother and my daughter. And I say without a home because I don't like the term homeless anymore. I do not relate to it and it doesn't identify me and it never has. Uh, saying that, it's because of the stigma and the myths surrounding um, being homeless. I was not abusing substances. I was not a rough sleeper. I had a job. This didn't fit with the image of homeless. And henceforth, neither my mother nor myself nor my daughter would ever even consider being homeless. We were simply without a home. We couch surfed. Don't see a lot of people um, in the media about couch surfing, but that's what we were doing. We were couch surfing. We were working and couch surfing. So the, the thing that, that, that concerns me about media is that it uh, doesn't talk so much about the systemic or structural or contextual problems that lead into being without a home or remaining without a home. It only talks to the sensationalist sort of bad decisions that was I noted before uh, of rough sleeping, which is only about 10% of the, the homeless population or people without a home population. So, I've uh, been doing a lot of media work, as you know, um, as I've been doing work with uh, most media except live to air television. Um, some has been good and some has been bad. Um, but, you know, in general, I think it's been very positive. I do believe people need to get out there and talk more about these structural, contextual and systemic um, issues surrounding homelessness or being without a home. I think the community needs to have their awareness raised when it comes to these complexities so that they can be better informed and make better decisions and probably um, yeah, rally together a little bit more to, to support our communities. So, I was a carer, I had a job. I was caring for my father who was dying I had a part-time job. I left a relationship. I often get asked in media, was it domestic family violence that lead you into homelessness? No, it wasn't. It was simply a relationship breakdown. Many people have them. But I always get asked that question because it makes for good media. But that's not my story, not my story. 
I was merely just had one argument too many, was under stress, found out that my father was dying and that I had to take full time care of him. I injured my back, I had to take unpaid leave and there was a lot of other little things going on. My relationship broke down and I'd used up all my paid leave and so on. And that, that's what caused me to become without a home, be, be without a home. Not a bad decision. It was my moral obligation to look after my father. I wouldn't have had it any other way and I would not call it a bad decision. I think it was um, more a moral obligation as a family member and I have no regrets. Having said all that, what I help to hope to say is that I would like a more ethical and responsible journalism that provides more full information, including the how, the why, the context, the systemic and structural issues that cause people to fall into being without a home and stay stuck in that position. Uh, sensationalist journalism only breeds stigma, myths, mistrust, places blame, and does not let the public know what is really going on or what they really need to know to make change. Um, as an interesting story is that uh, I, I've been conducting surveys as part of my role in the pest team and I often get taxi cabs because it's late at night. And seven out of ten, I would say, taxi drivers say, oh, where are you going tonight? And I go, oh, I'm going off to survey some people that um, are living on the streets. Oh, I get told all the time that they get offered accommodation but refuse to take it. So they choose to stay on the streets. Why is that when they're getting offered a home? And I have to spend the rest of that taxi drive <laughs> filling in all the missed gaps of information talking about the kind of accommodation they've been offered, talking about, you know, how it's only short term, talking about, you know, there has been no real growth in public housing since the mid-1980s, um, saying, no, it's not got to do with a lot of immigrants coming in. Um, all kinds of little miss bits of misinformation. I have to fill in the gaps. And that's why I keep doing media, is to fill in those gaps, to tell my story like it is, not like how people want it to be, but tell the truth, get the facts out there and inform our community. Yeah. And I think with an informed community that you educate society and it'll make more informed divisions that us versus them will become just us as a whole community, that we can all work together to end homelessness. And yes, I do try not to use that loaded word because it's very loaded. Thank you. Okay, so before we continue, I'd like to get some feedback from you. And there are lots of you. I'm absolutely... Pretty impressed by how many people are at this conference, I've got to say. I know that there are many of you who are very passionate about this, about how well you think the media covers homelessness. I'm looking forward to the response here. We have an audience poll for you, so if you can open your conference app right now and go to the live polling session. And while we do that, we'll bring up the question on the screens. Oh, it's already happening. So questions on the screen. The question is, is current reporting of homelessness in the media appropriate? A is yes. They focus on what is newsworthy to their audiences. B says somewhat. Some outlets report more responsibly than others. And C, not at all. The media focuses too heavily on stereotypical images, i.e. rough sleepers. You've got 10 seconds to plug your answer. Let's start the countdown clock. You call us sensationalists with that sound. It was very dramatic. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, if, I would, if I was to stab in the dark, I would have gone this way. 198 people say not at all that the media focuses too heavily on stereotypical images. 
Second big option is the nuanced one. Somewhat, some outlets report more responsibly than others at 158. And, ooh, 202 now for the other one, not at all. And uh, only five people say yes. They focus on what is newsworthy to their audiences. So I think it's pretty clear what this room thinks. Okay, we're going to get into the discussion. You are also welcome to ask questions. And, uh, look, I've got to admit, often the questions from you guys are better than the questions we've planned or I've thought of. Uh, so I might include them, all right, I will. I'm going to start with Jacob. So Jacob, look, you've already outlined really what you were trying to achieve and you guys can speak from there now so you can be more casual and comfortable. Um, in the program, you chose to take wealthy, privileged Australians on the homelessness journey. Do you think audiences, did you do that to create a sort of sense of relatability or, or was it, if I dare go there, kind of famous people tabloidy entrance point what, what was the thinking behind that look honestly you want people to watch i said that earlier you know and it is an entry point into getting into it of, of course but the point is you create all television constructs you know it's a fish out of water experience that works conflict in low level terms in television works you don't want a seminar about television production but it does you know that's what happens but that's like the starting point and that's like hopefully where we get it right is that that draws people in and from there you go on that journey. Again, horrible telly word, but that is what you do. You take people on a journey and people in, from their comfort, their living rooms, live vicariously through those five people. And just listening to Christine speak then, believe it or not, you can go from, I don't know, um, Benjamin Law trying to find a public toilet to then later on in the discussion talking about well what are the solutions what is you know where are we at with low-cost affordable housing you know both are possible in the same program and the audience are intelligent enough to cope with those things and that's what we try and do but yeah do we want to get people in the first place yeah because there's no point otherwise Catherine you've been working as a consultant as you explained as a practitioner and an advocate aiming you know aiming to strengthen public understanding of homelessness and achieve policy change what made you agree to be part of this program? Well, I didn't agree straight away. No, well, really tell us that backstory. What made you change your mind if you didn't agree straight away? Um, what made me change my mind is um, meeting Blackfella Films. Um, and because uh, initially when I was first contacted, I did laugh and just think, these people must be crazy. Um, but... When I sat down with them, talked to them, um, I never understood what we were talking about as um, a conversation about making television. Um, and even actually during the making of it, I know it's hard to believe, but I didn't really understand myself as making television. Um, what we were making uh, was a piece of mass communication about the structural causes of homelessness. Um, and that's a story that um, if I tried on my own to say to the Australian community, um, you know, maybe my mum would watch. Um, <laughs> but through this <laughs> artifice, uh, geez, um, there's a vehicle for a, for a much bigger audience. So for me, it was about joining a project, a communication project, a research project, which was, um, I guess, closer to what I do in real life. Anyway. And what, what was interesting about Catherine's reticence initially to take part is the very reason I wanted her to take part. You know, we want, that suspicion was really helpful, <laughs> you know, because that's what we wanted to make and that helped us make what we wanted to do because, you know, for all the reasons you discussed just now about the, the negative stereotypes and so on and all the, the you know, the fear of working and putting yourself out there in terms of the mass media, um, we wanted to hear that and work with that. I'm going to get to the other panellists in a second, but, you know, the question I'm getting a lot in the questions, but also it's just such an obvious one, is the issue of consent. People are at their most vulnerable and you've made them open up in the most in the most graphic way in some ways yeah. about that vulnerability. How did you go about getting consent and are there ethical issues around doing that? Lots, yeah. It's a long process, essentially. Um, you know, we are in the fortunate position of making television over a long period of time. So we have weeks of research, we go out and speak to people in the sector, 
we speak to many, many people experiencing homelessness. And as far as possible, all the way in the run-up to the series, we get what we call informed consent over a period of time. That consent is then reiterated during filming, after filming. Um, it's a very rare series in the sense that we work with people in the sector and we show um, what we call the rough cut of the episodes to um, organisations we've worked with and then we follow up with people again and we have contracts and working agreements with those people and if it's not deemed to be within the best interests of people to take part, that consent can be withdrawn. That is very unusual. <laughs> in, in, in journalism, in television, in, in, in many respects. But that's, and we're fortunate in that sense because we have more time. And I was amazed to understand more about that process um, because I, if you, well, I'm one of those people who when they watch the television, they think it's happening right then. Um, and so actually being involved in the making of made me more fully understand this is just like how I would conduct research um, that I do. Um, it is a long process. It is about informed consent, engagement, and so on. Just to you, Tom, 3AW positions itself as a broadcaster that represents everyday Australians. And of course, you're right, you know, lots of people listen to 3AW. There's not one kind of person that listens to 3AW in terms of politics. But in, on this issue, which you've been invited to engage on, the homeless issue, do you think your listeners, when you've kind of conducted discussions around this, around talkback, identify with the homeless person or is there a, a sense that they come in with preconceived ideas? What are your reflections on where that discussion goes, comes from? Oh, look, everybody has preconceived ideas about things and that's the reason we have opinions. Now, those opinions change, you know, people hear stories, they, they change their mind. I've done a lot of interviews in this area. Um, but look, some people are open to changing their minds, others are not. And, and to think otherwise is ridiculous. Um, if I had to, it's very hard to say what my audience, <coughs> pardon me, thinks overall, because there's so many different opinions. But by and large, there are people who say, look, you know, you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, they're a bit resistant to too much government support. Having said that, you know, there's a drought on, and any politician like Malcolm Turnbull who sticks their hand up and says, oh, we'll give money to farmers, that's a good thing. Um, we're often accused of focusing overly on, you know, the, the bad image of homelessness. You know, the people outside the Australian Open, the people sleeping rough outside Flinders Street Station, people who are obviously drug affected. And it's true, but the, the, the problem with broadcasting, well, not the problem, but the issue is, you know, just talking about today is the same as yesterday and tomorrow will be the same is not very interesting. You know, you do focus on what is different and what has altered people's lives. And unfortunately, you know, the types of interaction that the average person has with homeless people, they don't, if they have an interaction, sadly, it's often a bad one. Not always, but sometimes. And they're the ones that get reported on. There's an old saying in newspapers, if it bleeds, it leads, and it's true. Now, I don't believe that to be irresponsible. It's just that the things that stick out, good or bad, are the ones that get talked about on air. So, yes, look, I think people are ready to change their minds. I mean, one of the things I know about homelessness is how quickly people can descend into it. And I think there was a movie with Colin Firth about, well not Colin Firth, um, the Australian actor, I've forgotten his name now. He acted in Malcolm, but about a guy who had a middle class job and a middle class family mm. and over a period of weeks, everything just fell apart. And I saw that and, and it, it sort of made me, you know, really think about it. Because I thought, you know, you know, life is, you can hang on by a bit of a thread. And I've seen people who had, you know, went to private schools, had good families, good, you know, good education, everything that life you could possibly want. And I've seen people whose lives have fallen apart. So, you know, there is sympathy out there, but, you know, we, we report and we talk about what is grabbing attention. I mean, take footy, for example. What is everybody talking about at the moment? Not how great five games of football were on the weekend, but one player who's never thrown a punch before, who threw a fateful punch and whose career is now in jeopardy. Now, that's not irresponsible to talk about that. It's just the way things are. Christine, you talked about these questions that the media can sometimes ask that are, are loaded in some ways. And look, I'm putting my hand up, I'm sure time would too. I've asked loaded questions. I mean, the, the question, for instance, that you talked about being asked about domestic violence, the reason I've got to say, I'm just going to put that out there, a journalist would ask that. I, I, have, I wasn't the one that did it, but other journalists I, I can completely identify with is 
because we do take information from the sector and we've been told one of the reasons people become homeless or without a home, as you say, is because of domestic violence. So how can journalists, in your view, as somebody who's sharing those stories, do their jobs better given some of the questions you may get are actually based on information that we're given from facts and statistics and the sector to try and, you know, for, give us the kind of information about the bigger story? Um, well, facts and statistics are all well and good, but I would say, um, for one, on census night in 2010, you would not have had me or my daughter or my mother listed as homeless, for instance, and you would have no data surrounding a lot of people who just would not identify as homeless. So, um, given that though, um, the question is, really, I just think um, rather than, rather than g focusing on what people perceive as being the issues, I think just listen to the people who have actually experienced it and let them tell their full story the way it is and then you'll get a more clearer picture about what's actually going on rather than relying totally on just research and data. Um, I think just listening and focusing on what the person's telling you and reporting that alone will better inform people. Yeah. I'm going to go to some questions because you guys have a lot of questions. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with questions. So I'm not going to get to all of them. I'm just going to let you know now because I have that many. But but uh, I, I'm going to get to this one. And it's a question for Tom. In your role as Talkback host, how important do you think it is that you're informed on a topic that you discuss with listeners that call in? Oh, it's hugely important. I mean, people reckon I just rock up at 5 to 3 and start talking between then and 6 o'clock. Like... Me even being here today it cuts massively into my production time for my show. I would normally be at the studio now to prepare for a three o'clock start. So you've got to be informed, but then again, you've got to do six, eight, sometimes ten separate issues in a day. So you rely heavily on your producers. You've got to read a lot. I'm a voracious reader. Uh, am I informed about things? Well, I think I am. Would people disagree? Yes, they would. And the other thing you've always got to do in talkback is listen. It's mm. one of the things that I learnt when I started doing that. You are inviting people to come on your program. You need to listen to what they say because the, you know, we, we don't have fields of, or fleets of reporters out in the street digging things up. We've got a newsroom of about four or five people. That's it. So if we send one person out to cover a story, that's our one person. That's it. We don't have others. Um, but what we do have is, is our audience who looks at things, rings up and says, I've seen this, I've heard that. What do you think about this? And so I regard it as very important to listen. And not every caller is as worth listening to as some others. And remember, you don't know until they speak what they're going to say. But they're an enormous source of information. And that's what I rely upon. So I get as informed as I can. But then during the program, and I only prepare half a program. So when I go to air, I've got enough stuff for half the show. And the rest of it is filled by the audience. So I listen to the audience. Yeah, I think you've gone to a really important point, which is resourcing in newsrooms and really just how much resources can go into covering any well, particular well, we, we story, doesn't it? I mean, people act like, oh, there's so much money in media. There's none. I can tell you, the day that Rupert Murdoch dies, uh, he's often pilloried, but the Australian will shut down and half the newspapers in Australia will shut down because they are not making money and they are only kept going because Rupert Murdoch likes newspapers. So whenever you criticise Rupert Murdoch, just think that without him, a lot of regional newspapers in Australia simply would not exist. Right, the age is merging with Channel 9. Why? They're not doing it because they want to do it. They do it because it's the only way to have a financial future. Um, you know, I don't know what it's going to do to us because Nine's going to be my boss and I happen to have a bit of a problem with Nine for issues that I won't go into. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an uncertain future. Jacob, I want to ask you a question, again, from the... And it's anonymous. <laughs> oh, God. But it's a good question. <laughs> I've heard filthy, rich and homeless referred to as poverty porn... How do you ensure that the benefits of empathetic awareness raising from shows like this aren't outweighed by exploitative, feely voyeurism? Now, it goes to the similar question to ask, but it's a bit deeper, I reckon, because yeah. it's about that poverty porn that you want to watch yeah. and then feel really good that you're not in that situation. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, I think it's a really lazy slogan. Um, sometimes 
it's appropriate, but like any kind of slogan, it's kind of bandied around and see what it sticks on, you know, and it's used in that way. Um, how do you steer clear from it? You steer clear from it by being motivated in the right way, by having your moral compass before you start, by knowing why you're making something. If all that's in place, I think you'll steer clear from it. You know, I mean, I remember about 10 years at the BBC and someone once said to me, all television is is white middle class people pointing the camera at people with not very much and making entertainment out of it. So this debate has gone on for a very, very, very long time and in some cases it's absolutely true. But like I said, it's your starting point and your motivation as to why you do it. So, and, um, and you work with people like Catherine who, you know, slap them in shape and... All right, <laughs> okay, uh, 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 Paul's... Catherine, how did you slap him into shape? <laughs> like, give me an example of something that happened with this project where you said, no. Nah. Yeah, well, just, I just want to come back to your point about um, is it porn? I mean, my point in my remarks is that I think that is the wrong question. For me, um, is it about horror? Is a much more a sort of interesting question to ask. Um, you know, uh, does it um, kind of statically represent an image um, that is a horrific one in order to then trigger that kind of grateful return to, oh, well, um, those poor people, but we're okay, so that's good. Um, but again, as Jacob said, it all comes back to your starting place. So when did you slap him around? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, I've, I but I think remember. people here would be interested to know where... I, I, it's genuine, and I'm sorry, yeah, I am yeah, a probing no, journalist. Trying to, trying I can't help it. They, they might have been. You blame them later. <laughs> but I want to know where those lines, because, you know, I imagine Jacob, as a filmmaker, as a TV maker, you want to go to places that not everyone thinks you should I go to. I think, actually, I think probably it goes to the heart of what we're talking about today, is how program makers engage with people with a lived experience and just how, okay, so our job, I was obviously told, is we're an expert of finding experts, right? We're not experts ourselves, right? So that's the first thing, right? So you find the expert and then you work with people to keep you on your toes. So for example, um, yeah, everything from informed consent to just constantly testing what's the motivation, why are you doing this, what's, what's the point, what's, what, what's the outcome going to be? And I think that's, that's how you keep it moving. I think it's also arguing about process too, so um, yeah, feeling as though, um, like I was amazed at Jacob's reliance on the directors in the field. Yeah. Um, it's, it's as though five documentaries are being made at once. Yeah. And so to be sure as a project manager, uh, director, um, <coughs> that they're going to give you the vision that you want and search out the ideas that you want, um, there needs to be like good communication yeah. but also training. And so I went to Jacob and said, I can't believe you're relying on these yeah. camera dudes to do this stuff. Yeah. Um, I need to talk to them. And so we yeah. put in place education sessions where I then, as a group, basically did like ran... <laughs> A yeah. mini university on homelessness for all the directors as a group. That's and exactly that's right. Because as, yeah, exactly. as directors and producers, we think we're great at talking to people and getting stories out of people. But actually... Yeah, they weren't. No. And, so, and, they're, and they're talent... And they're, uh, exactly. Yeah. And they're talented people. And, well, the difference is they might be good at it from a old school journalistic television production point of view. In other words, did you get the story? Mm. Tick. You know, and that's the kind of bar that we may have. And then it's like, well, actually, how did you get the story? How are we going to go back again? How's all that going to work? Um, so that was vital. I mean, yeah, you basically ran workshops with people. Here's how to talk to people who were... Well, it did home. come down to that kind of detail. Like, if yeah. you're talking to people who have experienced a high degree of trauma, when you interview them, don't block the fucking doorway with all your stuff. Mm. Create space. Ask where that person's comfortable to talk to you, not where it best suits you and your camera gear. You know, if you're truly valuing a person's story, put them first every step of the way. And also, they're not sort of com commoditizing your great mm. jigsaw of, of program making as well. Do you know what I mean? Because that's the, always the danger. Mm. You know, we work with whiteboards, and well, that'll be good, and that'll be good, and then we'll shift. It's like people who are, when you're gone, they'll still potentially be in that situation. Yeah. 
Well, if I can, thinking about that. If I can bring uh, Christine in on that. Have there been any negative consequences to revealing your story? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I remember one, one particular uh, radio live to air. Um, I got asked a tricky question at the last minute, I think, to try and get a, some kind of emotional response out of me, but uh, I, I didn't give them that. Um, <laughs> but uh, immediately after hanging up, uh, I get a phone call from my ex going, Oh, my daughter's living in poverty and I'm going to come and get her now and I'm going to take her home and you, I'm not going to let her live like that ever again. And, and it was just like, whoa, 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 calm down, calm down. Put it into context, okay. And an, and other times, like repercussions with family. Why didn't you mention the fact that, um, like, I'm in a rental property, I pay the same rent as anybody else, but why have I not mentioned the fact that my sister and brother-in-law actually bought the house? for my mother and I and my daughter to live in. This is a, the, just things that I miss every now and then, but it has ramifications on my personal family life. Mm. Um, also, some things I don't like to divulge because, you know, my daughter's only 16. I, I don't like to do work in the local area in case my face is splashed around and then she has to, you know, yep. deal with it. Um, so, yeah, I've also <laughs> had... Yeah, you know, mum will go out with the dog and the uh, television crews come in and they're just, as you were saying before, you want to be comfortable when you're being interviewed for an hour. But I've had people come in and actually just move entire furnishings oh. around. Like the entire like yeah. living room is moved into the kitchen and then moved randomly out the back just so they can get that perfect shot, you know. Um, and that's really disrupting. And mm. it's sort of rather... Um, it's sort of a bit triggering as well because your space is being invaded um, and, and then you, you, you're getting interviewed about a lot of things that have been traumatic and, um, and, and it, does, it doesn't set a very safe place. So I'm really glad to hear that you allow that happening when you yeah. do your interviews. Yeah. They I could feel safe. I think that's important. I could ask Tom another question. Tom, uh, we saw the Herald Sun run really a, a very strong campaign against family violence, a very effective campaign that's been lauded, I think, by lots of people for, for its effectiveness. Uh, the Herald Sun's taken a bit of a different line on, on particularly, you know, sleeping rough kind of homelessness and, and called for tougher laws to crack down on rough sleepers. What are your reflections of when a paper, and this isn't a partisan who owns it paper, but, like, it's not the point of the question, but those campaigns, you know, taking a stand, for instance, on family violence and action there, but a very a different approach on homelessness, for instance. Oh, well, is, is it a different approach? I mean, you know, the Herald Sun's got, you know, a head editor called Damon Johnson has got an opinion editor called David Power. It's got, you know, umpteen opinion columnists like Andrew Bolt and Rita Panahi and me for several years and Susie O'Brien. Everybody's got different opinions. So, for example, you know, if someone wants to grab the domestic violence bull by the horns and say, we need to do something about this. I don't know who sort of led that charge at the Herald Sun because I just write and submit... Ellen Wynnette said, played a big okay, role there. there you go. Now, that'll be someone saying at a meeting, we should do this, all right? So you've got, like, an advocate for that particular issue. And it's the same even in their football commentary. I mean, you've got very different opinions. I mean, again, the, the Andrew Gaff punch. You know, you've got some people saying one thing and some people saying the other thing. So, again, and I, I don't know the answer to this, but... The homelessness issue was probably driven by one of their senior people walking in front of the rough sleepers near Flinders Street Station and saying, you know what, this is crap. You know, we're trying to show off Melbourne to an international audience. We've got the Australian Open on. Something has to be done about this. Now, I don't think it's wrong to kick off that debate. And, and by the way, I don't believe that just moving people on, as the Chinese apparently did in 2008 at the Beijing Olympics, is obviously the solution. It doesn't, it doesn't change anything moving them from one suburb to another. But it kicked off a debate, and you know when you kick off debates, you don't know the direction they're going to go. Again, th there's not some god entity like you know like Rupert Murdoch who comes in and says this is the direction we will go. It is a handful of people, quite a big group, like probably a dozen people with opinions, and every now and then an issue just just grabs people's attention. And it's the same in radio as well. So it's far more chaotic th than perhaps perhaps what you imagine. Where's responsibility in that though? Thank you. Well, when you say responsibility, Thank you. that's a fair question, but I mean, okay, I, I mean, in opinion columns, 
you know, you get one person saying one thing and another person saying another thing. It's opinion. That's why it's called opinion. I mean, you know, when I wrote for them and every day on radio, I make it very clear. What I'm saying is my opinion. It's me. If you don't like it, fine. If you do like it, great. But, but it's my opinion on issues. And it's the same with the Herald Sun, where there's not a, a fixed view on things. Uh, different people have different opinions. And, and it's the same when you look at the letters page. Again, you're just seeing a cross-section of different opinions. Um, so, again, what you, would, what, what you might say is responsible is possibly agreeing with what you think, and most people feel that way, but there is a divergence of opinions. And to say that there is a responsible line and an irresponsible line, frankly, is, is simplistic. There, there are different opinions about this issue. There are different opinions, but there are facts too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah there are facts. Okay, but which facts are you referring to? No, I don't mean that at all. No, no, no. Say facts. No, but there are no, there are like we live in a world where there are well, just facts said, that we all have to agree on. The census didn't include that, that you were not homeless on the night of the census. True. So the census is a slice of fact put out by. Yeah, the I would ADS, call that facts. Right, you would. Absolutely. And yet it didn't include the fact that you were homeless. So that's what I'm saying is is that you can grab a census figure. But it's not just opinion, though, is it? Well, that's not. No, but, but opinion in terms of what you do about something is opinion. Yeah. I mean, for example... Yeah, absolutely, opinion, the response to it. One opinion about homelessness that got up was move them out of the Melbourne CBD. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that's the correct one. It's certainly not the only opinion, but it is one that somehow got, got precedence. And maybe it was a Lord Mayor under pressure. It probably was. Robert Doyle was under pressure under that issue. Or, so what, yeah. what I'm saying is, is that there are different opinions on how to deal with homelessness and there are different opinions on how to report it. And the best thing to do is don't just expect the Herald Sun to present everything or the age. Read different newspapers, li listen to different media. Media is more diverse than it has ever been. Look online. Of course, what most people do is they have their own opinion and they seek out other opinions that are the same as True. theirs. And that is, a, that is an absolute truth. Hmm. But this idea that there is a responsible... Look, responsible journalism is about finding the facts and presenting them. But a lot of what is presented as irresponsible is in the opinion pages of the paper, and it is branded opinion. Right? You will not sway what Andrew Bolt thinks. I know Andrew very well. He knows what he thinks. That's it. And he repeats it <coughs> over and over and over again. People like it. They do. Um, but you were just saying before that most of your show is run by the opinions of the actual call-in people. Half of it, yes. Half of it. Okay, so... Their opinions are like-minded. Well, no, they're not. They're incredibly varied. I get, I get people call and come up honestly, and yell on the, about program, the next person. You and obviously, yeah. don't. I can tell you, I get one person says one thing. The next person says, "I disagree with that caller," mm. and it just goes bang, 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 bang. And then, I mean, if you were to weight the calls, it would be six in favour and five against. What does that mean? But I mean, I mean, we talk about topics that people have opinions on. It's boring if everybody thinks the same way, and, and I can tell you, they do, they do not. I think there's also something really important to say here around the education of people who become journalists. Like, just because people are journalists, it doesn't mean that they somehow know uh, all the answers or have uh, great opinions. Of course they um, don't. You know, I think what's interesting, having taught in a Bachelor of Communications, uh, is the incredibly low exposure of journalism students to social, political and cultural analysis. Yep. So why we would think that journalists have the skills, sorry, uh, to <laughs> offer yeah. us a structural or systemic or solutions focused analysis of an issue, um, I'm not sure we can necessarily even expect that if we're not sure that they have the, uh, the skills and yeah. education behind yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's really important in this discussion that we do divorce opinion when Tom's yeah. done that mm -hmm. and reporting, and I've always been on the reporting side of the ledger, which is, and that's why I say facts are important, so we can agree that this, uh, there is an explosion in homelessness, and then we can, and diverge, on the solutions. But if you can't agree on the facts, society breaks down. Mm. Sorry, but the, the facts matter. We have to agree about what we're talking about, or we're living in, in some parallel universe, which is a world I don't want to be in. This country is democratic, and we base things on facts, right? So... Ultimately, then, when you talk about responsible journalism, whatever that means, yes, it's different opinions. There are ethical lines and journalists subscribe to ethics. But 
I'll, I'll kind of ask you a challenging question. I mean, journalists go in and report on new things that they see. They are not experts. Isn't it an unrealistic prison that you're setting up? I mean, it's, it's never going to happen, is it? How can, it, how can any well, newsroom well, employ bunches say, of experts that can go in forensically? Politicians are the ultimate journalists. I mean, you know, about the only politician who is actually an expert in their field is usually the health minister who, most of the time, but not all the time, happens to have been a doctor in a previous life. I mean, you, you have to be a generalist. You know, I was asked earlier, am I informed on every subject? Well, I read as much as I can in a short space of time. And I'm not even trained as a journalist, by the way. I mean, I was a business person before this. I, I, just, I just happen to be an opinionated bugger. That's what I am. I mean, I think well, Jacob, what I think, did you want to well, say? I think, well, I think part of it is not being informed in the first instance, actually. You know, in old school journalism terms, it's like, I don't know, so I'm going to find out. Yes. I mean, that's how... Yep. You know, you were trained as a journalist. That's right. You know, and, and actually, I hold dear to that because it's bullshit to think you can know about everything. You're an expert at finding experts. That's the job of a journalist, yeah. <laughs> to go and find out, but not be the expert. Well, I'm going to put some images on screen. I don't like talking to advocates and experts. I, I like to talk to people at the source material all the time. Oh, I, well, expert, when I say experts, I mean people who know what they're talking about. Well, but Whether they've got a title after their name or not isn't, doesn't bother me. I, I, I would rather speak to a homeless person. They're an expert at living, yeah. Yeah. Uh, having a lived experience of homelessness. Yeah, I think I it's agree. a... Yeah. All right, let's put some of these images up um, for everyone to <laughs> consider. You guys look in front of you, you'll be able to see them. Um, some of the images that have been used uh, in the reporting of this issue. And there's, the, of course, that Herald Sun issue with picture of um, that woman and the police behind her, which has been contentious. What do you make of that image on the front page of the Herald Sun? Who has some reflections on that that they're willing to share? Because I know that one is certainly has been very divisive. Well, I remember it well. Um, and look, the Herald Sun, like most uh, tabloid newspapers, specialises in headlines that grab you. They, I mean, they have a team of people that try and work those out. And that one, from their perspective, is very effective. Um, they do the same thing with politicians. If they want someone to look dodgy, they'll scan through 50, 100 photos until they find the one where someone's got an unfortunate expression. Pictures do tell a thousand words, and that was the picture they were trying to tell. Here are some aggressive homeless people causing problems. And that's what the picture does. Uh, did you get consent from these people? Well, I don't know. I didn't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom wasn't responsible for the image or or the publishing of it, so I probably can't answer to that. But yep. Catherine, do you have any reflections on that? Well, I'm just wondering about the story that um, Tom's seeing in this image. Um, for other people, they may be seeing other things. Like, isn't it great to see uh, a younger female voice being shown as angry and standing up and saying something about the state of housing in Australia? Because um, it's not often people don't necessarily understand in the general community that homeless people can actually be women and maybe they can be angry women too. Um, so I think you can have any image in fact, but it's then what story do you use that image to tell? Yeah, I'm, I'm as interested yeah. in the headline that goes with it. Yes. Anything. Because the that's headline. telling you what the story is about. I assume it's the shock tourist, is it? Shock, is it that which one went with it? Or rabid without a cause, I don't know which one. But you know, that one was rabid without, without a cause. cause. Okay, yeah. so there's a pretty strong cause. <laughs> yeah. <But> anyway, <laughs> very strong. <laughs> it's a strange headline. Uh, so clearly, I, I, I'm just going to put it out there because I have worked at News Corp too, and and you know, I've worked across the media. Those images are going to continue to be used because they are striking images that tell a story. Do you, do you seek to change that? Is that, is that the ideal world you, where the, those kinds of images wouldn't be used? I think it's a great photo. <laughs> so it's you're really, you're comfortable with it, you don't think it's, because well, I know other people have different views. Cause, mm. You know, when angry women are only termed rabid, there's an issue there. Mm. Uh, without a cause, I mean, why are we here? It's clear that there's a cause. Mm. So it's not that image that offends me. It's then the care that is taken to offer um, a contextualised and balanced understanding of why that woman's angry. Exactly. 
Mm -hmm. Tom, the headline is clearly the issue that at least the panel's taking an issue with more than actually the image, although I've seen it, you know, other people concerned about the image as well. Is, that, is it fair game as the headline? Oh, look, I mean, as again, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this was taken around about the time of the Australian Open and there was anywhere between 40 and 60 uh, people without a home, to use that vernacular, camped around either Flinders Street Station or between Flinders Street Station and where the Australian Open was. Now, it's not normally a place where a lot of them sleep, and I know the area very well, but they chose to because I believe that there was a statement to be made. Now, we could debate. The best thing to do would be to ask that woman, what were you, what were you saying to the, I think it's a, a policeman, but, you know, I don't know who she is. She's probably still around. She may still well be homeless. I don't yeah. know. Um, let's just be clear here. You know, the Herald Sun's main job here is to sell the newspapers, all right? And that sort of headline is the sort of thing that helps sell copy. So there is that self-interested issue. Is that responsible? I don't know. Again, if you look just beyond the headline and read the articles, mm -hmm. you will find there were some journalists at the Herald Sun who wrote very much in favour of trying to help out homeless people, others who said, clean them off the streets, this is a terrible look. Now, to say that one is responsible, one is not, I, I regard that. And again, when you look at the stuff on the other side that's got Rita Panahi, Rita is an opinion columnist. That's what she's writing as her opinion. You might disagree with it, but it is branded as opinion. But the, it, it may well be that that reporter did hear what the woman was saying and she might have just been swearing at the police and calling them effing pigs and get away and this is my place and F off. And in which case the headline is accurate. So you'd have to speak to the journalist to say, what did you hear that woman say? You don't know. This you don't is, know. This is all assumptions. No, I know it is, but I'm simply saying, there, there's, there's, you're all saying you know what this is about. And I'm the one who's saying, look, we actually don't know. It may well be that she was drug affected and swearing at the police and hence the headline. Or it may well be that it's irresponsible. I just don't think you can tell by looking at it. But the Yep. Well, it doesn't. If someone, if someone comes up to you and for no reason just starts swearing and spitting at you, I think you, you might disagree with that. Uh, no, I would actually ask really? them. I would ask them immediately if they're okay and what's going on and what help do you need. That's the first thing I would do as a well, concerned citizen. I would well, not be taking a photo and putting rapid without well, a cause. All of those people, as I understand, accommodation was found for them and the authorities did try and do the right thing. But if you're aiming it at the journalist who took that photo or the different, because it's usually one person who takes the photo, it's another person who does the headline. Mm. I mean, I didn't do it. I'm, I'm just yeah, saying I suppose if I can just happened. take back the chair, the, 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 mi the microphone. <laughs> oh. Okay. All right, well, that's some... Um, Three days. How lucky. All right, if we can just get, get this back on the rails, if I can. There's rails here, guys. Um, the point is, I suppose, people see things through different prisms, right? And okay. that's, that's, again, called society. Uh, so people do think, see things differently. It's how to engage in a respectful way to tell people, again, which is what journalism should be doing the facts and evidence-based solutions around it. Jacob, I have a question for you. After Filthy Rich is screened, what's next? How do you engage people? I mean, uh, you know, I know as a producer, you'll be like, what are the ratings like? How well did I go? Because that is the motive, selling papers, yeah. your show doing well. The media's yeah. motivations aren't just to change the world. <laughs> they are no. often to sell their product. Yeah, it's more likely that you'll help change the world if people engage though, and that's the point, I guess. Um, well, we did the first series and we did the second series. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, there's a live discussion show off the back of the third and final episode where um, we invite people in, those awful experts, Tom and myself, talk about stuff and, and try and think about some of the solutions around where we're going. Um, I know, and this is one of the interesting things about the relationship between media and stories is you know this because we move on. Yeah. Right? Yep. And that's our job also to move on. So, yeah, we'll find the next, you know, documentary. The, or the next crisis, because the next there's no crisis. shortage of things going wrong. Yeah. I mean, we hope it has a long tail, as we call it. We hope this <laughs> continues. But, you know, we can't fix it. You know, that's not our job. But we hope that people who have the power to do so look more, look more closely at mm. it, you know. But, yeah, we will. You know, we, we will move on. And that's just... Yeah, so given that, the fact that of course the media moves on and the media doesn't have all of you and now are passionate about housing and homelessness, but the media 
might dip into that, but it's not their central reason for, for getting up every day. They have a different mission statement and different objectives. <laughs> Given that, I'm interested to get your perspectives on this, Catherine. How do you, how do you keep an issue like this the focus, what do you need to, the other side of the picture, provide to the media in terms of keeping the interest up, telling new stories, because that's the news and news. <laughs> the media is interested in the new angles and the new stories. How, does, how do you think of your responsibility in that equation? Um, you certainly don't wait for the media to become interested in whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and look, I'm now in Tasmania, I'm very lucky, it's a small state, we have really close personal relationships with our media, particularly the Mercury newspaper. Um, and so I just write stuff and tell them to publish it. Now, lucky me to have, to have that. Um, but look, I actually think it's quite a good principle. <laughs> um, Newspapers, television are desperate to fill the other half of their show. Correct. Uh, don't wait for them to come to you. And think carefully in your organisation about framing, um, about how you want to frame the issue of homelessness. And don't let that be driven by uh, what you're seeing elsewhere, but what your organisation and the people in it feel is a core messages uh, that you need to get out there. And how about the... The res I don't know if the word responsibility is right, but I'm using it because I can't think of another one. A bit tired. I came back from Gama last night. You should all go to Gama next year. It's amazing. But, um, but the, I suppose the other part of the equation, which is making sure that it's an informed debate rather than... And understanding that people do have different perspectives. As Tom said, you, know, you may not like that people have these perspectives, but I too can tell you they do, and it's a dominant perspective. I don't take... take talk back but I have text messages and there this sentiment is strong this frustration that the streets are full you know not not always sympathetic so how do you engage with that rather than just being angry that that sentiment exists for me the media is the gap um, between what the community knows and what a whole range of experts know mm -hmm. so it's how do you support media through teaching through engagement, through offering good stories, through being proactive, support them to tell a range of stories in that space. Can, can I just add to that? I mean, you're right. We, we rely heavily upon people pitching stories to us all the time. Um, understanding different media is important. Like, I mean, I contrast the AB, you know, we'll often get a guest and I say I was on the ABC last year and I think they're going to get 45 minutes to sit there and pontificate about a topic. With us, I'll get seven to eight. Now, it's not because people have short attention spans, it's just that we try and pack more in and just move from thing to thing to thing. And so, a guest who understands that, who knows that <coughs> if you waste five minutes of your introduction talking about yourself and your life story, you might miss the chance to tell what, what you're actually there for. Like, understand the media. You know, and again, in my time as a, as a Herald Sun columnist, you know, don't overwrite an article. If you're told it's 800 words and you present 1,200, well, someone else will chop 400 of them off. So <clears throat> understand the media that you're presenting to, pitch ideas, I have a solution, have you heard about this, this is interesting, that will grab people's attention. And that, that's what I would say, whereas I can't tell you the number of press releases I get, I read the first few paragraphs and it's put me to sleep and it just goes in the bin. You know, if, you, if you're there to advocate on behalf of an idea, sell it. Because you know, people want to be interested in something, they want to be informed, entertained, they want to learn something, but you know, your job if you're going to be an advocate is, is, is to do that. I would also say, though, that I think there's resistance to be undertaken with journalists and journalism. I think we can all be advocates for slow journalism, for careful journalism, and as a sector, I think we also need to slow ourselves down. When we get contacted by various media outlets saying, oh, quick, have you got a young person who's about 16, uh, mm. preferably a girl, homeless, we yep. just need her. We're rather think, specific, I admit. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow, our service was going to get on the telly or, you know, this would be good coverage. Stop and think. Again, how do we want to frame the message? What is the story our service wants to tell or our organisation as opposed to what is the story this reporter has contacted me about that they want to tell? But, but all that is a fact. 
It is very fast moving, Tom deals in that word. I mean, and Dom's right, you know, like we, will, we are open, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because we rely on you and others to provide our stories. That's the truth of it. I mean, like, you know, if you, if you get, I mean, I'm a council of homeless persons rang you up after a, a tour, didn't they? And then, then the next week they were on, or the next day they yep. were on, yep. giving a more rounded discussion for mm. that debate. So, like, you know, the door is very, <laughs> very, not more than a jar, you know, because we rely on the stories. Well, I'm glad we've begun the conversation. I reckon it's going to keep going. I want to thank all of our panellists, uh, Jacob Hickey, Dr Catherine Robinson, Tom Elliott and Christine Thurkel, who have all given their perspectives.